Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Lynn Mooney. I'm co-owner of Women and Children First Bookstore. And first, I want to thank you all for being here this evening on Women and Children First Crowdcast channel. Uh, and thank you for being here this evening for the paperback release of this wonderful book, The Taste of Sugar by Mary Elvera, Mar Maris Elvera. Um, I'm looking forward to the conversation this evening, but first I have a few announcements. And first, the first one is that because we actually begin our virtual events the same way we used to start our in-store events, and that's with a land acknowledgement. So please join me in acknowledging that the land on which our bookstore stands is the occupied unceded territory of the Peoria, Potawatomi, and Miami people. There are more than 75,000 indigenous people living in Illinois, and we strive to recognize and honor native history, literature, and community. We encourage all of you to learn more about land acknowledgements and also about the rightful owners of the land where you are viewing tonight's event. Next, I'd like to do a little shout out about one of our many upcoming events. Uh, on Monday, uh, July 12th at seven o'clock, we'll be hosting a virtual event with Kristen Rapke, whose new book is called Seek You. It's an exploration of loneliness in our era of social media. She'll be in conversation with Mega Majumdar, who's the author of the recent novel, A Burning, which is also just out in paperback. If you'd like more information about that event or any other event we're holding, uh, I encourage you to go to our website, uh, www.womenandchildrenfirst.com, or follow us on social media. Also, if you are located in Chicago, I just wanna make sure that you know that we are pretty much completely reopened at this point. Uh, feel free to visit our website, um, but we are welcoming sh shoppers into our store. Uh, we have returned to nearly normal hours. We are requiring uh, mask wearing, and we are still keeping a restriction on the number of shoppers at a time, trying to center the health and safety of both our customers and our staff. Um, also, if you're not in Chicago, please continue to shop on our website. We um, always enjoy shipping out packages around the country, and we'd be happy to help you with your book needs. Also, some housekeeping events for tonight's event. Uh, if you have any questions for the author or her daughter, um, please use the Ask a Question tab at the bottom center of your screen. Um, Elisa will be monitoring that and incorporating your questions into the conversation. Uh, so please, please add your questions. Also, uh, please note there is a buy the book tab on the screen as well. We would certainly appreciate uh, any impulse purchases of the book um, that maybe you didn't plan on making when you logged on this evening. I think by the end of the evening, you're gonna wanna have this book. So there you go. I think that's all you need. And so we're gonna get started on our evening. Um, Maricel Vera is a Chicago writer who grew up in Humboldt Park. Through her work, she explores the particular burdens that Puerto Ricans on the island and in the diaspora carry as colonial subjects of the most powerful country in the world. Maybe that's debatable, but that's a footnote. Her latest novel, The Taste of Sugar, earned notice by the Chicago Reader, which called it the best new novel by a Chicagoan in 2020. She is also the author of the novel, If I Bring You Roses, about a Puerto Rican couple who chased the American dream by migrating to Chicago in the 1950s. Elisa Vera Ramos is a director, actor, and theater maker, and a founding member, member of Women of Color Performance Collective, Femmelinen, Femmelinen. Sorry, I've mm -hmm. tracked that. Uh, besides being active in the Chicago theater community, she also toured in other cities, including Austin and New Orleans. She is also an activist who focuses on a wide range of issues, including racial justice, sexual health and rights, and the identities of young people. And they are here this evening to talk about Maricel's new novel, just out in paperback, The Taste of Sugar. Um, I'm not gonna go on very long, but I really wanted to say that I found this novel 
nearly impossible to put down. Um, I always love a good historical novel. And this one weaves family and hardship and loss and the importance of culture. And I always enjoy a story about those people who decide to take that huge leap and immigrate to a new place. Um, I just am always in awe of people who just won't be cowed by the challenges of that, which are so many and numerous. Although the story hews closely to matters of family and individual personalities, there is also a clear sense of the characters in a specific place and time in history. As many of the reviewers have pointed out, Marisol strikes the perfect balance between this being a story of powerful individuals making important life choices, but also showing how these decisions are at least in part limited by circumstance and time and place. But she does this in a way that does not diminish these characters and their power at all. Um, again, I'm, I'm just in awe of what she's accomplished with this book. Um, and I think you all will be too. So I wanna turn this over now uh, to Maricel and Elisa. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you to Women and Children First for hosting me and Elisa, thank you. All right, well, here we are. Hello, mother, how are oh, you doing? Good. I'm good, I'm good. How was your day today? Today is good. I did an event uh, with Women and Children First in the Humble Park. So that was really great, yeah. People Beautiful, yeah. Some books. I was able to stop by in Cafe Colau um, in Humble oh. Park. Uh, was giving out coffee. good coffee, really delicious coffee if you bought the book. And happy, happy paperback. Thank you, thank you, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Live Right was really great and they uh, treated people to coffee. So that was nice, delicious coffee. Yeah, Recommend it. Um, yeah, I just think it's so incredible. I'm I'm really just like proud of you, and um, like it's it's beautiful to see the reception of the novel and also the um, uh, like growth that it's had after being published in hardcover last year in a pandemic, um, and then um, and then the audiobook coming out which was so beautiful and you don't always like, uh, you know, an author doesn't always get an audiobook and a fantastic actor to read it. And I know it was important to you that that person speak fluent Spanish and all those things. And then the paperback. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, why don't you tell folks a little bit, like whatever you think is helpful to share um, about the novel and, and read to us a little bit. Okay, great. Well, The Taste of Sugar is about um, a Puerto Rican couple um, in the eve of the Spanish-American War. That's when it starts. And that's around the time that they get married. Uh, but they are already married for several years um, when there's a Spanish-American War and um, the United States invades Puerto Rico. So when the United States did that, by couple who are farmer, uh, coffee farmers, um, they suffer financially, uh, as many, many Puerto Ricans did on the island, and they don't know how they're gonna recover. And then less than a year later, while um, the Americans are in Puerto Rico and they have a military government, uh, there's this great hurricane named uh, San Siriaco that's very similar to um, Hurricane Maria in terms of the devastation that um, happened in, on the island and the effects on the people, the Puerto Rican people. So because of these two very great events, um, 5,000 Puerto Ricans actually in real life decided to migrate to Hawaii and work in a sugar plantation because they had to feed their families and there's no other way that they thought that they could do it. So my couple is among those 5,000 that do this. Um, and that's what um, The Taste of Sugar is about. So what I like to do is um, read a little bit about, um, from the voices of two of the main characters. There really are two main characters, Vicente Vega, uh, the coffee farmer, and Valentina Sanchez, the coffee farmer's wife. And there's a third character, uh, Raulito um, uh, Villanueva, who's the brother 
of uh, Vicente Vega. And, and he's sort of like a secondary character, but a very important character, but I won't be reading any of his pieces now because I feel then you would know too much about the book and then you wouldn't want to read it and we don't want that. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to read. And he's also, he's also a child at the beginning and a then sort of grows the up. Yes, yes, and he grows up. I would up. say, I mean, I would say the couple, you know, Vicente and Valentina also grow up together. They, yes, because they're young, young. yes. And it, it really, it takes place, I would say in like a 10 year span. Although we may, we learn a lot about their ancestors uh, in the novel. Mm -hmm. Thank you, well, go ahead. Okay, so this in the paperback is on page 40. And if you notice that I don't read every single word exactly uh, the way I wrote it, it's because sometimes I just can't pronounce it. So uh, chapter three, <laughs> that's a secret, not a secret. <laughs> I'm the actor, but you're killing it. <laughs> sometimes in whispers, Vicente and his brother Luisito called their father Raul Vega, El General. His father's temper was infamous throughout the countryside. He often overheard people say that Raul Vega tenía mal genio o un carácter fuerte. So whenever en general inflicted scorn to scar their skin like the slash of the whip, his older brother's eyes bore into his, say nothing. Raul Vega had taught his sons that the way to know coffee was with your hands and your feet. When Vicente and Luisito were children, their father had set them under a bush to pick coffee berries. Vicente hadn't dared to complain about the mosquitoes and other insects that flew into his eyes and stuffed themselves up his nose. Evil branches scratched his face and tried to stop his picking. He dreamt of trees. When a tree asked him if he were a bird, Vicente observed the ghostliness, ghostliness of the moon, free to come and go as it pleased. Vicente whispered, I am the moon bird. The tree whispered cuentos that the birds had brought back from other lands, tales of riches and pirates and oceans longer than days. A tree complained about the owl that kept it away each night. Why didn't it fly down the mountain and bother those trees? The coffee trees wished that their taller cousins, the banana and plantain and guava trees, wouldn't hog up all the sunlight because they too wanted to bask in the sun. There was an eagle that perched on the crown of a tree with such delicacy, the swish of its massive wings as it flew away, woke Vicente from his dream. Even Raul Vega admitted that Vicente had the gift. Vicente's fingers need only touch the coffee berry for it to drop into his palm. He didn't mind that the berries didn't ripen all at once and the trees must be picked over again and again throughout the harvest. He told the trees, your berries will be washed and dried and roasted to make coffee so delicious that it is a drink for the gods. Mere mortal, mortals will pay for it in gold and silver. Your berries will become coffee beans that will be transported in ships to faraway places I could never hope to see in this life or the next. Your berries will be transformed into coffee that will be served in the palaces of the most important people in the world, the kings and queens and popes. Your coffee will kiss the lips of the most beautiful senorita and be served in cafes to idle people who will linger over tiny cups bewitched. There are people in the world who can never live a day without you. Vicente never shared with others his conversations with the coffee trees, but it wasn't because he thought his brother Luisito would laugh at him or that his father might question his sanity. It was because it was between him and the trees. The trees liked the murmur of his voice, his words wrapped around their leaves as gentle as the nightly fog. When he ate dinner, his thoughts were of the red coffee cherry nestled in the green leaves, not the rice and beans and malanga, and not even when they had pollo fricasse, his favorite. He was back in La Finca, his gaze on the banana and plantain and guava shade trees, blessing their huge green fronds. When he examined the coffee cherries, he held his breath, exhaling only when he saw that they were healthy, that the lack of rain hadn't dried the berries, 
or that too much rain had stripped the branches bare. When the green berries ripened, they would glisten on his palm like rubies. Thank you. So that is Vicente's part. And then I thought that I would read two of the letters. Yes? Yes. Uh, from Valentina. Uh, Valentina is um, Valentina Sanchez, the other protagonist. Utuado, June 4, 1890. Dear Dahlia, thank you so much for the wedding present. Such a lovely pair of silver candlesticks. I keep them on my dressing table to admire them every night. And they came all the way from Spain. Pity me and describe your typical day. I promise not to envy you or at least not very much, because I am quite happy on the mountain with your cousin. Why did you never tell me about him? I forgive you, because if he'd never come for your wedding, or if you'd never invited me, then we'd never have met. How funny life is. This morning, Vicente brought my coffee to me in bed, despite his mother's disapproval. I fear that Tutia doesn't like me, but Vicente reassures me that she will in time. I'm always busy here. Gloria, tu las conoces, is training me in the art of housewifery. By the time we move into our own love nest, I'm sure to be an excellent ama de casa. Inez, you know Inez, is teaching me mundillo. Claro, her lace is quite fine and worthy of one of your Parisian gowns, but she says that I'm improving. Write me soon. It takes so long to get your letters. Of course, it's because mail must come by ship halfway across the world and not from San Juan to Utuado's general store. That part of the journey probably takes as long as a voyage due to the terrible roads. Regards from tu primo. And we send ours to your husband and to España. Besos, Valentina. P.S. When will you go to Paris? This one is to her sister. Utuado, June 4, 1890. Querida Elena, Vicente just brought me your letter. It was a lucky thing that his father sent an honor into town. Otherwise, it might have been several months before I received it. Unfortunately, that is where the mail is picked up and delivered. Everything is such a production here. So much effort is required for the littlest thing. How are you and your family? I thank you for your letters. It helps me to feel that I haven't been forgotten by my family. Thank you for finding someone to bring my things. I can't wait to get them. It's been almost six months since we married. Sometimes it feels like a minute, sometimes five years. Oh, don't mind me. Tengo un poco de depresión. Gloria warns me to watch out because a city woman like me is prone to un ataque de nervios. Gloria is a servant I told you about. Sometimes I think I'm the other one. Vicente's mother, Doña Angelina. Yes, I still call her Doña says that I'm learning to be a proper ama de casa, but some days I think that I'm in training to be a servant. Do I really need to learn how to make uh, starch from scratch? Can't I just buy at the pharmacy like we did in Ponce? It seems that we can't because there is no pharmacy nearby and people in El, in El Campo make everything themselves. Unfortunately, Vicente's family isn't wealthy like Dalia's. I don't understand how that could be because they're the same family. Elena, I'm sorry, I didn't start this letter intending to worry you. It's only that I was thinking of Dalia in Spain living me sueño when Doña Angelina called me to help pick up the bones out of the codfish we're having for dinner. Si, sí, bacalao, don't tell papa. I don't want him to know how much of a jibara his daughter has become. And it's not that I'm really unhappy or don't like bacalao because I do. It's just that while Utuado is very beautiful, it's so far away from Ponce, from you and our parents, sometimes I feel so alone. There is La Doña again calling me to the kitchen. She probably wants me to help Gloria wash the pots. The other day, Vicente's mother made me clean the La Doña is at the door, I must go. Muchos, muchos besos, Valentina. P.S. As to that other thing, I still can't tell you in a letter, but I'm hoping that it will come to nothing. P.P.S. I think I might be in Cinta. No one knows yet, not even Vicente. I know he'll be glad, but it's too soon. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. Those to you. Thank you. Water from me. <laughs> <laughs> 
white wine because it felt festive. <laughs> Lovely. Well, you know, I want to just start, um, especially because we were talking earlier about, you know, this being an event for women and children first, which is like one of my favorite independent bookstores. And I love giving my money <laughs> to this place, <laughs> feminist bookstore. And we were talking about really spending time talking about the women, you know, and I, you know, I love that you read these letters, especially the letter that you just read from Valentina, who of course is the main character and um, to, to her sister, right? Who lives in a different place. And that's the only way they can really communicate. And I remember reading the book and many people have said this actually, reading the novel and looking forward to and feeling like my heart sort of rose every time one of them was able to receive a letter filled with love from the other. And so I guess I, my question is like, you know, can you talk a little bit about that sister relationship between Elena and Valentina um, and maybe any other like, women relationships that um, that feel important? Well, I think in the book that the women really support each other and they're really important to each other because um, it's not like they can go to the theater or they could go hang out like we can do now. They basically are at home. And where Valentina lives up in the country, um, it's such a production for her to go anywhere and, and one point in the novel, uh, her mother-in-law, and Helena talks about how uh, since her marriage, it's been some years before she could even visit her own family. It don't, they don't live too far because you have to, the roads are bad and a woman can't travel by herself because it's dangerous. So she has to have a, somebody to go with her to take her. And then when you're farm people, that's not so easy because during um, uh, times of the year, you're working on the farm and maybe when there's time to relax, it's a rainy season and then you can't go because of the roads. And in this period where, Ali where Valentina lives um, in Puerto Rico and Utuado, it's um, very dangerous on the road because there would be uh, people who would, you know, like robbers who would um, rob you um, and uh, they would do things like uh, um, if you were carrying your, a farmer was carrying his coffee, um, oxen, you know, on oxen, that's how um, they would mm -hmm. carry them. Then if somebody was going to rob you, then they might, uh, they might kill you. They might steal your stuff, throw your oxen over the mountain, you know, into the side of the mountain, down the mountain, that kind of thing. So it's so it's dangerous. And um, what they have are letters. But Valentina is, she has a relationship with her sister, Elena, where uh, she can communicate with her through letters and occasionally a telegram. But what she has in person is when she moves into uh, Vicente's uh, family's house, she has um, not her mother-in-law, she has some kind of relationship with her, uh, but she also has uh, the servant Gloria, who is like a second mother to her and who teaches her things that she will need to know later and that will help her later. And also her mother-in-law does that too, teaches her things about like uh, what plants are good for this, what plants are good for that, how you make this, because you need to know how to make these things in the country. You can't just go to the store. Um, there is like a general store somewhere on the mountain, but it's you can't find everything that you need. You will need to make things. Uh, and uh, there are always wealthy people who could get things from Spain and from Paris, like her friend Dalia, who she knew in another town in Ponce in the middle of the island, came from a very wealthy family. And they got a lot of uh, things from um, France and Spain and England or whatever, but um, Valentina doesn't marry into that kind of family that has the kind of money. Mm -hmm. But what she does have, uh, she likes the money. She is rich in female companionship. So she learns all these things. And even though she's not with her mother and her sister, she has a love of um, Angelina, Angelina's partner, Inez, 
is sort of like a mother to her and also um, uh, Gloria, who is like a mother to her. So she's very fortunate that she does have women who can support her. Um, because in those days, if you were gonna have a baby for one thing, you didn't go to the hospital, you needed the women to be there and the women always to help you and teach you. I think it's beautiful to hear you talk about that because, you know, there is certainly a, um, I don't know, sort of, the, I, I guess, a, 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 a thread of patriarchy that we, of course, um, or at least I was expecting as the reader. Um, you know, the man in the house who does whatever the hell he wants and wrecks emotional havoc, <laughs> essentially. And um, you mean and who is that, Elisa? Raul, the older. His father-in-law. Right. And then, you know, you do get you do get many different, um, you know, kinds of men, but there's there's certainly a threat of patriarchy in addition to the society um, being sort of like managed and built by um, cis men, both um, colonizers and sympathizers, mostly um, white men and men who are light skins, who are able to sort of like, you know, design um, economics and design um, trade and, uh, you know, even the roads <laughs> um, to, to support them, right? Um, but yet we have this really sort of rooted, beautiful, like matriarchal core that is of the home for most of the for most of the novel but i also think it's valentina's dreams and imagination and hopes you know what i mean she really is a creative person as well so i think that that is a really nuanced dynamic well i think it is a very violent society uh, for the reason that you said, um, like, uh, and you mentioned the roads, like the roads, and uh, I write about this in uh, the novel, how uh, they brought Chinese to work on the roads, and um, they brought these prisoners from Cuba. They were Chinese prisoners in Cuba, and they brought them to finish working on the roads. And then the Spaniards, because this was during the Spanish colonial period, which was over 400 years, We've only been a U.S. colony for 123 years, I think. Um, and so during the Spanish colonial period, they're, they're building these roads and the, the Spanish promised the Chinese that they would take them back home when they were done. Um, but the rumor was that maybe they threw them overboard. Nobody knows. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, yes, I think it was a very violent society for a lot of the, for, uh, because men run it. Uh, I mean, look at Christopher Columbus was the first, you know, he was violent. He came yeah. to Portugal, he said it was the most beautiful island in the Caribbean. Um, yeah. So uh, <laughs> I think that the women, the women are, um, they're strong. They have to learn to be strong. It's, very, very hard for them, but they have to learn to be strong. And I feel like that's uh, the way the Puerto Rican women are, who have been, uh, who are in my life and the Puerto Rican women who have been in my life, that despite the circumstances and the framework of how they're raised and they have to grow up, somehow they uh, mm -hmm. learn to be strong. And however, maybe it's not the way that you as a young woman in this time might be strong, um, because maybe you have more advantages and uh, um, more options, but somehow they they manage and, and they are strong. And they cultivate like beauty with the lace and love, you know, through food and through just 
chilling on the porch and yes. just things yes. like that, which I think yeah, is lovely. Yeah. Somebody told me, you know, you talk a lot about food in this novel. And I never really thought, oh, I'm going to talk about food. Uh, but I think that food is really important because from the very beginning, we learn that a lot of people don't have food. A lot of people are starving. From the, in the very beginning of the novel and the uh, prologue, we learn about Puerto Ricans who are passing out on the street, on the road, because they are starving. Mm -hmm. So food is very, very, very important to Puerto Ricans. Mm -hmm. So in our family, you can't go to somebody's house and they offer you food, you have to eat food. Right. It's the way we show love and affection or respect by offering you food. And so maybe that's why I have a lot of food in the novel um, and why I, mm -hmm. somebody told me today I should have put in the recipes. And I'm like, um, no. But, <laughs> Sounds like a partnership that like someone else who, who does that could, you know. Uh, at least uh, <laughs> collab, a collab. You told me, remember when uh, over the holidays you were making a dish and you're like, how much, how much? Puerto Ricans usually don't tell you, oh, one tablespoon of this, two teaspoons yeah, of that. Yeah. We're like, you do this, and then you taste it. This tastes good. Okay, maybe you need more salt. Mm, maybe you need more of this. This is a way, more sofrito. This right. is the way, dude, uh, nor, usually that's the way Puerto Ricans cook, and that's how we teach other uh, you know, young people, other Puerto Ricans to cook by watching, by tasting, and then you figure it out. And there is like ancestral memory around that. And there is, you know, um, uh, like oral tradition around that. Like, that's why I was saying to you, like, I actually just wanna, and we've only done it once, but I'm like, I actually just wanna cook with you in the kitchen and have you hover over me. And you know what I mean? Like I actually want to want that men mentorship. Yeah. But I, I love that you said that food is also respect because I think there is also, you know, you talk about the hambrientos um, in the novel, yeah. these oh, people somebody. who are literally starving. And, um, and there's, um, there are people and characters in the novel that, um, you know, for, and, and, and I, I was, ooh, it resonated with me because I'm like, these are my literal ancestors. And like, I had no idea that, you know, for a hard day's work of who, who knows how many hours, sun up to sun down, physical labor in the hot, hot sun, probably not a lot of water, you get like, you know, one uh, plantain <laughs> and you, you don't have the energy to cook it. Yes. Or you get, um, you get a yucca. You know what I mean? And there's, so it's like root vegetables and you no know, protein. And it's funny because these are, well, not funny, but it strikes me that these are like, you know, vegetables that are, that I have love for. And yet there is this history of um, oppression um, that is that is really rooted Pun intended. <laughs> yeah, so this is like the the poor people. This is uh, I wanted to say that we're talking about los hambrientos. What's super interesting to me is that the in the beginning of the novel, it's a Spanish colonial period, and los hambrientos are passing out everywhere, you know, from the faint and dying because they're starving. But um, then um, some years later, when it's the American colonial period, which we are still in. Uh, and then the, uh, the right um, after uh, the Spanish-American War in 1898, and then there's uh, Hurricane San Siriaco less than a year later. Well, there are more hambrientos, and this is the American colonial period, and they're passing out, they're dying uh, from hunger. Some, uh, in both periods, uh, some men killed themselves, hung themselves from, from trees. This is like factual. Uh, because they were just overwhelmed with, um, with uh, sadness. And they couldn't feed their families. Desperation, they're desperate. And some, sometimes they're just so desperate, you know, you're driven to something so extreme uh, because you can't bear the pain to see your children um, 
dying, your family dying from hunger. But I think it's interesting how both colonial periods kind of like the same thing. You know, and I thank you for that. And I think, um, yeah, and we do see so much devastation and poverty and neglect still um, on the islands and, you know, from uh, ex President Trump, you know, throwing the the paper towels after Hurricane Maria to just like the was it the governor colluding to like hide um, uh, resources to help people live? You mean then? You mean now? That yeah, a couple of years ago. Hiding how uh, how many people had died. Uh, yeah. The hurricane. What's interesting? Yes, yes to all of that. But same what's shit. also <laughs> sorry? I said same shit. <laughs> yeah. What's also interesting is that in this period, uh, the novel. Uh, so let's say um, 1898, 1899, and even to every single every single president of the United States has has not cared about Puerto Rico, every single one. There is not one that has cared about Puerto Rico, not one. Um, what the last president did was that he uh, made a big exhibit of it and you know made it a big joke and he actually verbalized uh, publicly what he thought about us Puerto Ricans. But no Puerto Rican president has ever cared, not, well, not a one. Um, Anyway, I wanted to say one little side thing when you were talking about the workers uh, for my new novel, I've been doing research and um, that, so it's in uh, taking place in the 19, 1930s and for a working a day, sun up to sun down, picking, uh, cutting cane, people got 40 cents a day, 40 cents. That's not enough to feed. A, it wasn't enough to feed a family. Forty cents. No way. It's nothing. Mm. So that was, that's more or less. That's a that's about what they were getting um, in the time of my novel. Uh, so here it is, thirty years later, thirty five years later, and it's not any more money. But things are a hell of a lot more expensive. People are desperate because your fundamental right to eat. You can't, as a human being, every, every human being has a right to food, right? Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, weren't able to. And I think, you know, this novel is such a beautiful way to invite the reader into, um, like, the experience of, people trying to be human and live in dignity and you know yes. access pleasure and and cultivate love and raise their kids and you know i love the the passages about um the one that you read about vicente and like the nourishing relationship that he nourishes the plants and the plants nourish him mm -hmm. you know like like have space for dreaming, even if you don't have space yeah. for rest. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Because he's dreaming while he's working. Um, and I think so, so yeah, I think that's gorgeous. And also, you know, there's a really great um point in the chat that I, you know, um when I was talking about before about patriarchy and other other intersection intersecting oppressions, like I think um the point in the chat is that you really address the misogyny super well. And I think you, for me, you are um, like helping us like feel the truth of the matter and even like get into different people's like minds and spirits. But the, but and the narrator, the like prose voice, you know, you or <laughs> the omniscient, whatever, you know, is not letting us forget that this stuff is fucked up. You know what I mean? Is not letting us forget like the misogyny is not okay. The sexual harassment is not okay. The anti-blackness is rampant, right? And people have different experiences of that based on how the, their literal skin color, right? And the economic um, injustice is violence, 
right? And so I guess I wonder if you could say a little more about um, like how you're balancing those two things, like telling the story and also in sort of like a broader way, helping the reader to orient our values and like our context. Um, maybe it's a question like, how did you develop that prose? I don't know, but any thoughts on that? Well, I know the Puerto Rican culture very, very well because that is my culture. Uh, and I know the way women are treated and the way men are treated because that is my culture. And, and I experienced it firsthand. Um, and the more, I, uh, it was important to me to write this book from a personal point of view because I want people who don't know Puerto Ricans, those people who wondered after Hurricane Maria, hey, is Puerto, are Puerto Ricans Americans? What's, you know, they had no clue. And in a way, it's kind of like not their fault. It's a, it's a fault of the education system in the United States and it's a fault of being a colony because that's what, when right. you're a colony, the, you're, um, uh, you're, the people who govern you, uh, don't want you to know your history because right. if you know who you are and if you know your history, you might want change. And they don't want that. They want, they're want they perfectly fine with the way the United States government is perfectly fine with Puerto Rico sinking into the ocean right now. They don't care. We, they just don't, us, don't want us to cause too much trouble and they want to get as much money out of us as they can. Those are the two things that they want. And yes. next, as little money as they can give us to survive. Uh, and, and money that is like from taxes from Puerto Ricans, not even giving. It's money that is our right. Uh, okay, but so then I want Puerto Ricans. Relevant, relevant. <laughs> yes, people who don't, uh, who don't know Puerto Ricans, I want them to get to know us, to know us as people because uh, the beauty of a novel is you get to know the story through people. You get to immerse yourself in people. Uh, uh, compared to nonfiction, which I love to read, but then you only get the facts. And so that's where uh, writing a historical novel is real, and reading it is really great because not only do you get the historical picture, but then you get to experience it through the people in the novel. Uh, and it was important to me to get the historical facts right. So uh, for many years, I was researching uh, the history, listening to people, uh, asking questions, because I wanted to do this for people like you and me, who are Puerto Ricans, people who have to celebrate us so that we can know where we came from and we could be proud. Uh, and also for people who are Puerto Rican, but who want to learn about Puerto Ricans and who really want to understand about Puerto Rico. Well, if you really want to understand Puerto Rican history and why Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States, well, then the taste of sugar is a good place to start. I think. Uh, and then the back of the book, there are a few other books that you could read. But let me say it's a challenge. It's a challenge to write it. Uh, but I love challenges as a writer. That is mm -hmm. my, I love telling stories. And if it's a challenge, it's like, oh my God, I don't know if I could do it. I'm going to try. And I just keep on trying and trying. And I hope that I can do it. You never know if you can do it. You once once you put your book out there, you don't know if anyone is gonna like it. If your agent is gonna like it, if she's gonna want to pitch it, you don't know if she'll get a publisher. You just don't know. You don't know if it's published. If people will like it, or write terrible things about it, you just don't know. But you, but I I do it because this is my reason for being put on this earth. I think other than you uh, two, my children, but uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> This is my reason. I'm not, you know, as a writer, I would love to write these kinds of stories. I'm really passionate about learning about Puerto Rico, learning about Puerto Ricans, writing about Puerto Rico, writing about Puerto Ricans, writing our story. And, um, you know, you just, you just keep working. You try, you try, and you hope you're successful. Well, and I think, you know, as you're talking, I was like, I really think that I, in in large part, like learned social justice values and orientation and like fervor from you. You know, I feel like you're always 
growing up, you were always like, no, that's not okay. Or like you would always be very, you were very in your, um, uh, like what you wanted and what you needed and very vocal about it. Um, nice way, I, hope. I think, <laughs> what did you say? In a nice way, maybe not Alisa. <laughs> well, I don't know. Well, I mean, sometimes, Sometimes people need to be called out, and that's just what it is. <laughs> I mean, I but I you, you are Puerto Rican. Don't forget that. You're Puerto Rican. Remember, I was always telling you. That. And you always were like, yeah, wear the tiny shorts. Like, you're, you know, <laughs> young. You're the, you know what I mean? And, and so I feel like I grew, like, a sense of my worth and also, like, of, like, what human rights were almost and of course I learned about it a little like more in college and as growing up and became an organizer and different things like that but I really do think that this novel and the novels that you you know the the the, the literary work that you're putting into the world is activism right it is a, a very intentional way to sort of um fight against that like um erasure and you know the convenient white supremacist colonialist amnesia that like we all seem to you know um swim in because that's the way to sort of keep people disconnected from their from their ancestors and from um their worth you know so i really appreciate that and i think i mean i know that you've gotten really good um just like outpouring of love and response from Puerto Ricans and from folks who, you know, are not Puerto Rican, but really connect to, you know, many parts of the story. So, yes, yes I've actually had people, strangers, apologize to me for everything the United States has done to Puerto Rico. <laughs> And how do you feel about that? What do you think about that? I'm like, thank you. And then I let it go. <laughs> but you know what? I'm not going there. <laughs> Like, I'm like, okay, do that. <laughs> if you're really sorry, I could give you a list of things that you could do right now, you know? So, but I don't think people really I mean that. say that, but they don't really want to do the work because everything is work. Totally. Everything is work. If we really want to change things, we have to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have to do the work. And a lot of people don't want to do the work. It's a lot easier just to, you know, be watching uh, something on TV that has no nutritional value, you know, which yes. I like that sometimes too, but we are, yes. but you no, know, but we also have to, I don't know. I feel that we should all yeah. try to do something for others other than ourselves. You know, I don't know yeah. that we're put on this earth or that our reason for being on this earth, I don't know what the reason is, but for me, I don't think it's just to, to make myself happy and buy pretty things and read books all the time because I could do that. That'll make me very happy just to read right. books. <laughs> I could be, read novels all day. That's my thing. But I feel that I have to write and it's important that I do because my stories are necessary and yes. at least they're necessary to me. And they're necessary to people like me who grew up in Humble Park, for example, people who grew up in Humble Park who didn't have any kind of uh, uh, education about Puerto Rico or about the kind of people that we are and that we were. And yeah. I feel the lack the of genius that. of and our ancestors. If like you were a teenager and or a young person, even your whole life, if you don't know where you came from, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. are not grounded. And we have to be grounded in order to grow and in order to change and in order to, you know, uh, to to love, I think we have because then we, can, we can't can we really love ourselves if we really don't know ourselves? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe some mm. people asking the big questions. Today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I always have the big questions usually of myself when i'm writing okay yes i have uh i have like uh folders uh, notebooks that are all historical facts notebooks about everything i want to put personally i mean i have all these notebooks and i wish that i could be very organized in my notebooks and i start trying and then i give up because i can't find that notebook it's not on the right page and it's just a mess but 
I, I do have faith when I write that I will find the uh, historical fact, or whatever it is that I need, that'll come to me. And usually yeah. it does come to me. And clearly the like most salient, most resonant pieces are coming through because, you know, it's here. Um, yeah. Yeah. And speaking of, speaking of work and speaking of questions and like digging for truth, um, can you talk a little bit more about, um, I've got a question here um, about how extensive your research was for this novel. Um, how long did it take? What were the resources? And maybe you can talk a little bit about, um, you know, specifically this piece around Hawaii, right? Because that is something that I literally was like, what? You know, until you found that information and started writing the book. And I would have never known if not for Taste of Sugar, yeah. essentially. Well, I think I've been, um, I started researching this book about, I would say like 20 years ago. I started collect collecting little pieces of um, a history about Puerto Rico um, 20 years ago. And fortunately for me, every everything I do like informs each other because basically I write about Puerto Ricans. So whatever, you know, I'll read it. And I, I, I trust that I have like this fantastic, I used to think of a file cabinet, but or file cabinets, but something in my brain and that the important thing are being, you know, cataloged. And if not, if uh, when I'm writing and I feel like something's missing, I have my notebooks and I'll, I'll look for it. Um, because I like this book, I really wanted it to be historically accurate because I don't mm -hmm. want it to say, oh, this is a very nice story about Puerto Ricans going to Hawaii, right. but you know, didn't really happen. I'm like, no, it really didn't happen. Check everything here if you want. I stand by it. Um, so um, 20 years and uh, the Hawaii part, um, before I could find things on the internet, one of the things that I did was I, I learned about the Sugar Planters Association in Hawaii. So I wrote the library and I said, I couldn't go to Hawaii. I had little kids. It wasn't possible for me to spend like two months plus who was, I need somebody to pay me to go somewhere, do research. I know that that happens to some people, but that hasn't happened for me yet. So I'm doing this all the time. <laughs> and I wrote, and this librarian wrote me back and um, she said that she could, I think I asked her about the newspapers. How could I access it online? And I couldn't. But what she did was she went through uh, the library and um, she Xerox every Hawaiian newspaper during my three year period that had the words Puerto Rican or Puerto Rico in it. And she sent it to me and I, I paid her like a hundred dollars for the uh, photocopying or something, which is nothing for me. It was a lot at the time, but I still have those newspapers and they were very, very helpful because they showed me how, uh, I, I learned how they how racist they were about, about yes. from the about the Puerto Ricans, and and I learned about the Japanese and the other and the Koreans and the other people that were also in Hawaii, and uh, I learned about how during this period in uh, Hawaii the first three years, mm -hmm. seven out of ten something like seven out of ten Puerto Rican men were uh, put in jail and and worked in chain gangs. Seven out of ten Puerto Rican men that went to Hawaii because um, the the circumstances in a lot of the plantations were very very uh, brutal, and uh, a lot of the Puerto Rican men um, were farmers or they they were like laborers that could decide their own hours. So then they go to Hawaii and it's totally different. Right. Yeah, they, they, the the um, the policemen come, they wake you up. I mean, it's just brutal. And some of the men are like, I'm not doing this for the you, t you promised me this much money, you're not giving it to me, I'm not gonna work it. So then they would say you were a vagrant and they would toss you in jail and they would force you to work in a chain gang. And they were much worse to, uh, you know, uh, Raulito because he's a black man. So, um, and, but here's the thing that I learned that I was like so furious about was, I was furious often when I was writing. <laughs> but one of the things I was really furious about was that the Puerto Ricans, Vicente realizes this, but not completely in the novel. The Puerto Ricans were paying taxes. And the oh, yeah. that the Puerto Ricans were paying were paying for the policemen who came and beat them up and put them in jail. 
and they didn't know it. I mean, they're making hot dogs, <laughs> so they have to pay for this, and they're not even told it, you know? It's just, I mean, it's just so cruel, and it's kind of like now. What I was going to say, talk about incredibly... incredibly in police officers, no. Incredibly yeah. relevant, yes. And just the criminalization that you're that you're naming yes. of black men and brown men and assuming that they are up to no good and all of those notions, yes, the cultural yes, narratives yes. around vagrancy, like and criminalizing, like what, like yes, oh my God, wow, 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 wow. Yeah, There's so much. What, what I really, uh, but what I liked about um, the writing about people is like, I feel that Puerto Ricans have it hard in Puerto Rico and the United States. Uh, uh, other other people too, but I'm speaking just about Puerto Ricans. And, uh, and in my novel, the Puerto Ricans have it hard, but they're able to find community. This is something that we Puerto Ricans are very good at, finding, uh, making, having relationships and finding community with each other. Like they take their music and they take their, yes. their so people actually took like gandules to Puerto Rico. And, uh, and, and so then they're able to define community and they're able to, um, you know, to, to enjoy, enjoy each mm -hmm. other. And they make friends with people, like they made friends with the Japanese. And that's another thing that they did in Hawaii. Basically they segregated mm -hmm. everyone by their nationality because they didn't want people like the Japanese had been there a while and they were already uh, union, like unionizing or, you know, getting together. And they didn't want that. Because then, it's you know, fighting and conquering, right? Yes. And the idea of like uh, solidarity is essentially strength. And again, all of, I mean, all of the nuances of the design of the society yes. and the impression that yes. then we get to see through these characters and how they well, navigate it. Basically segregated by design, just here in like in the United States and then mm -hmm. certainly in Chicago. Mm -hmm. But I love how you're also talking about like, you know, I just said navigating, but like the the genius and like I really think the love, like I think it's a novel about love, like the ways in which um, folks, you know, do their best to thrive and pass that on to their neighbors and their friends and their children. And I think um, I, I want to kind of end on one last note because I, I think maybe it's a fun question, right? Which is. Um, you know, Valentina really grows into a feminist. Yes. And uh, so I love, I love the development of the relationship that she has between um, her and her husband. And one thing that I love is that she loves sex and that she loves to like experience physical intimacy. And like, that is something that like, like gives her like, strength and like the juice to go on. Um, so will you talk a little bit about like, I, I don't know, you have this whole like pedagogy, I think about like how you talk about or how you write sex, but why was that like important to like thread into this like epic, you know, story of, of oppression as you know, and, and migration? Because Elisa, my characters to me are real people. I don't think of them as characters. They're real people. And so, uh, you know, they have to live and they have to love and they have to have sex and they have to uh, cook good food. I mean, that's why. So I, uh, every, every character has a, a different um, journey or is, or, is, or is different in whatever ways. And this is Valentina. Valentina was always hopeful. Her head was in books and she she grew up uh, thinking about uh, romance novels. And so for her, you know, it was so easy mm -hmm. to have that be part of her personality because she sought it even as a young girl. Mm -hmm. well, and I love how you then, you know, well, first of all, we love to see a woman who is like in her sexual power and like asking or and like you know making space for what she actually wants in that way but i love the the idea of you know the the physical hardship and labor and like exhaustion of the way that folks have to live and the the just like sadness and like all of that and the idea that like intimacy and touch 
can be such a solace and such like, yeah, nourishment. I don't know, that word keeps coming up yeah, tonight. Yeah. And I think that's one of the ways that they can uh, survive. You know, what happens to them is uh, to other the love, the physical love, and uh, mm -hmm. also the love that she has for her sisters, her new sisters in yeah. London. You know, people that are there to help her in the very hard times who are living the same kind of circumstances, right. you know? Yeah, yeah. The people like working by your side and, and in the kitchen with you and and um, mm -hmm. being able to depend on and build care networks with. Um, yeah. Yeah, and what I like about the Puerto Rican women is a lot of the Puerto Rican women I know, we're not like these sweet little uh, taffy apple, cotton candy kind of women. <laughs> we have like a biting wit, a lot of us. Yes, yes. And yes. My characters do. They do. They're like, you know, okay, come on, I see you. Don't, you know. <laughs> we love that too. <laughs> Well, on that note, we'll close tonight. I'll pass it over to Lynn and say also buy the paperback. There's the link right below. And your brother wrote the questions. We got to mention that. I agree. Buy the paperback. Um, thank you, Maricel and Elisa. This was so special and so delightful. I'm sure everyone enjoyed it. So. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you, Lynn. Thank I do. You. I do think it's maybe relevant to quickly say just to lift that piece around around my brother, um, Marisa's son, writing the discussion questions in the back. They really are like, and they're just in the paperback. They really are some of the most like rich um, questions that I've ever read in the back of a book. Um, right. So definitely ponder them yourself and, and hold, host a book club and, and check those out for sure. Well, my and thank you. Uh, yeah. My, that was the best book club questions that she ever read. So. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you, Women Children First. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>